Um, I want to thank again Congressman Meehan and uh, invite up our, our next uh, guest, a, a dear, dear friend to veterans, someone who has been uh, out there fighting for us uh, way back from the time he was in the state legislature. Uh, he was uh, one of the sponsors of the first Agent Orange Jamboree uh, in Brookline back uh, about 1980. Uh, uh, and he was one of the first people to come and out and listen to us, uh, listen to what veterans had to say, to treat us with respect, uh, and as uh, Congressman Meehan said, attention. And he has been a great advocate for us. Uh, many of us in the room will remember uh, the days down in the speaker's dining room when smoking was allowed. Uh, uh, Barney uh, with uh, Tip O'Neill, Joe Moakley, and the old, whole delegation there is uh, sitting around and smoking cigars with a bunch of uh, then uh, not gray-haired yet uh, Vietnam veterans. Uh, he continues to be a friend. He fought on the floor for the extension of the uh, education uh, part of the GI Bill. Uh, for post-traumatic stress treatment. He was a great friend of Brad Burns, uh, who many of us remember uh, really organizing Vietnam veterans back in the start in the late 70s. Uh, and he's always welcome here. Whenever we ask him to come, he comes. And he's a, a great friend. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming Barney Frank. Thank you. And uh, since Irvin Russell is a regular attendee at the annual event on the mall. I continue to stay in touch with the uh, Vietnam veterans uh, operation. Uh, let me just begin by reinforcing what Congressman Meehan told you. Um, you have a really extraordinary thing going on under this administration. In every previous war this country has had, we've raised taxes. I was just reading a biography of Alexander Hamilton, and you read about how during the Revolutionary War they had this constant effort to try and find sources of revenue. Under President Bush, we have had two wars and five tax cuts. That's a major reason for a lot of the problems. I don't believe that the leadership in the Pentagon is insensitive in principle to the need to protect Americans, but they have created this financial bind for themselves that does put constraints on their ability to provide that money in terms of the protection that the troops ought to have. One of the last questions, the notion that at this point, when you have veterans coming back in very high numbers, seriously maimed, tragically, at a time where the Korean War veterans are entering that age bracket where they're going to be greater and greater consumers of medical care with the Vietnam vets. You've got Vietnam vets now. That war uh, goes back 40 years for a lot of people uh, are starting to be in that category. The idea that in the richest country in the history of the world, when we are giving tax cuts to people who make millions of dollars and abolishing any estate tax so that when Bill Gates dies, his kids will inherit every penny if he wants to do it without having to pay any taxes on it, without ever having earned it themselves. The notion that you then charge veterans a co-payment and an annual fee for the privilege of having gotten sick or injured when they were risking their lives for their country is just appalling. And I, there is some good news. I think the country is starting to wake up to it. I think the president benefited from the virtual unanimity in this country on the need for us to defend ourselves after the terrible mass murders of September 11th. But now we're looking at the specifics and uh, what, what all this is being grouped as the uh, slogan for the administration is this is the ownership society. Well, I would amend that uh, slightly. It's the you're on your own society. And if anything bad happens to you, you're on your own. Ownership is a good thing. But the notion that all we do is to help the people who own and forget about everybody else is just not right. You know, this whole social security thing, I got to ask Alan Greenspan, you, you get to ask Alan Greenspan questions. Greenspan invented the rope-a-dope long before Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and the deal is, with Ali, you had 15 three-minute rounds. With, with Greenspan, you get one five-minute round. So there's no way you can really pin him down. So I thought I would ask him one question 
where he would either have to say yes, no, or refuse to say it. And I asked him if he'd been in Congress, would he have voted for Social Security? And he wouldn't answer. And he wouldn't answer because he's, to give him credit, he's too honest to have said yes. And he's too smart to have said no. Obviously, he would have voted against it. He's philosophically opposed to it. And that's what we're dealing with. I mean, again, the notion that you have two wars, and one of them clearly a war of choice, as Congressman Meehan pointed out. The war in Iraq was a war. Uh, the war in Afghanistan was a legitimate war of self-defense. The war in Iraq was a decision to go forward for, to achieve policy goals. And to do that while you are cutting taxes means everything else gets cut education and jobs, etc. And somebody asked about jobs. And we have, here's the number one domestic issue facing America. For a variety of reasons, technology and then also internationalization, and they're linked. Now, one of the things that's been happening to us is that geography is becoming less and less and less important. Today, given the nature of technology, you can essentially make or do anything anywhere and sell it anywhere else. Geography means very little. There's still some localism in some of the service areas, but even the services that we've seen get outsourced. You know, we were giving people job training 10, 12 years ago to learn how to use computers. The jobs we trained people for 10 or 12 years ago now aren't in this country anymore. They, they've outsourced those jobs. So we have this problem in this country, which is we are now able to get richer with less working less for, for working people. And Greenspan, again, he can be intellectually very honest, and he said a year ago, a little less than a year ago in April, we are growing very nicely and productivity is increasing. When productivity increases, that means we can make more money. We can create more wealth with less effort. But he added, all, all, his word, of the increased wealth we are generating is going to the owners of capital and none is being paid to those who work for others all is going to the owners of capital none is going to compensation paid in wages and everything they can do to advance that they're doing that it means busting unions opposing a minimum wage doing away with job training cutting taxes in reverse for the upper income people but not for lower income people so that's the bind we're in. I do believe the public is starting to react to that. Now let me just talk specifically about the Iraq situation, which has exacerbated that. One of the things I'm working on since I'm the senior Democrat on the committee that deals with housing, one of the proposals they've got is to essentially uh, to, to cut way back on and totally change the community development block grant program, which is very important for all the cities. They said, well, we've got to save money. The Secretary of HUD was before us. And uh, housing for the disabled, you talk about these guys coming back. Housing for the disabled, they are proposing to cut that in half. Some of you will remember a years ago when we had to do a separation from housing for the elderly and housing for the disabled. And this affected a lot of vets. In the older days when we said it would be housing for the elderly and the disabled, public housing. People were thinking of the disabled purely physically. And then we began to realize people are disabled by, 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 by terrible stresses early on. There are people with substance abuse issues and mental health issues. And it did turn out that having younger people with emotional and substance abuse issues living next door to 80-year-olds wasn't a good idea. And so we said, here's what we'll do. We'll allow a separation so that the elderly can be only for the elderly. But we will provide separate housing for the disabled. We'll provide Section 8 and we'll build more housing for them. That was the deal. This administration is now in the process of repudiating that deal. In the current year, we're spending $380 million to build housing units for people who are disabled. Secretary of HUD proposes that we cut that by more than half, cutting out housing for the disabled. And we say to him, well, how can you do that? Oh, well, Section 8 is costing us too much money. Yeah, Section 8 isn't costing a lot of money. The Section 8 program totally in the country, or the CDBG program totally in the country, each one of them costs less than one month of the war in Iraq. So that's really what we have to be clear. If, it weren't, if we were not now at war in Iraq, none of the cutbacks in domestic spending that George Bush was asking for would be necessary.
In fact, if we weren't now at the war in Iraq, you could restore all those cuts to veterans' health. You could not threaten Amtrak as they are trying to do. You could not cut community development block grants. And you'd have tens of billions left over to help reduce the deficit. So the war in Iraq continues to impose enormous costs in money and, of course, even more so in terms of lives. We are still losing two and three and four people a day to the war in Iraq. And I know the argument is, well, but, you know, Iraq wasn't democratic and may now be getting democratic. I, I understand that. But there are dozens of places in this world, unfortunately, that are not democratic. I mean, why does the rationale for invading Iraq not mean that we should go invade Burma and Myanmar? I mean, basically, you want to go to the place where there is more repression than anywhere else just by sheer size. It's China, I suppose. That's too big. You know, it's, it's food. You don't pick fights. You can't win easy. But what about Saudi Arabia? I mean, is Saudi Arabia a democracy? Uh, why don't we? I mean, if the criterion was we will send young Americans into battle and we will spend hundreds of billions of dollars, which is what Iraq is now costing us, because we want to bring about democracy. How do they come up with Iraq as the, as the number one issue? I think the answer is we should be pressing for democracy, but I do not think we can as a society afford to spend hundreds of billions of dollars and send our people there. And they say, well, uh, in fact, even in Homeland Security, they tell us, sorry, we, well, we'll go back a step. Every single program whereby the federal government gives money to local communities to hire more police officers and more law enforcement personnel is either being cut or abolished in the president's budget because of our safety. Now, we have young men and women at risk in Iraq, but most Americans are much more likely to be hurt by crime here in America than they are by what goes on in Iraq. And if we weren't in Iraq in the first place, we'd be spending a lot more. So then the question is, what do we do about it? I believe we should start now planning an orderly withdrawal. Here's what troubles me about their definition in Iraq. First of all, and it does look as if the elections, it doesn't look as if the elections went well, but it is not clear to me how much good what could come out of it, because this administration's history of predicting events in Iraq is atrocious. A, you know, when, when Rumsfeld said you go to war with the army you have instead of the army you wish you had, that's not the problem. The problem is that they totally misread the situation in Iraq. Remember, they thought we would go into Iraq and there would be cheers and it would be like the Memorial Day Parade. Everybody would be cheering. They grossly underestimated the resistance we were going to see in Iraq. That's why they sent people in unprepared, because they thought they, they just got it wrong. And since then, every time something changed in Iraq, and I'm hoping the elections are different, but every time something changed in Iraq, they told us how much better things were going to be, and they didn't. First of all, they said, when we won the war, everybody would cheer. And did you see their argument, by the way? Afterwards, we said, well, how come things were so much worse in Iraq? They blamed the Iraqi uh, regime. They said, you know what they said? They didn't fight fair. I mean, they didn't stand up and fight with us. They melted away and they went to the hills. I guess we forgot to tell them the rules. The Marcus of Queensbury rules for being invaded. You're supposed to stand up. I mean, what, what, what terrible failure of intelligence was it that they assumed that the Iraqi army was going to fight like the charge of the light brigade instead of like a guerrilla army? I, I, sadly, that was a terrible miscalculation. Then they said, all right, well, here's what's going to happen. Remember when capturing Saddam Hussein was going to be the big thing. And we captured Saddam Hussein and things didn't get any better. And then we set up an interim government and things didn't get any better. There have been a series of things we've done and things hadn't gotten better. And while I am glad that a lot of people turned out in the elections, unfortunately, Americans and Iraqis are still getting killed at the same rate. And I, 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 George Bush is, you know the story about the boy who cried wolf. The boy who said, oh, something terrible is going to happen and then nothing terrible happened. The Bush administration in Iraq up until now has been the reverse of the boy who cried wolf. Every time something happens, they say, oh, now the danger is past. And it isn't. I mean, every time something transpired, they would say, oh, isn't this going to be great? And then we'd get bitten in the rear end. So I, I, I call him the guy who said nice doggy. He's always saying nice doggy, and then we get bitten. Now, we have had this election, but here's my concern. Iraq is not facing a foreign army. This is not Vietnam in a number of ways, and one way it isn't is 
There is no North Vietnam. There is no large country which is a military base for who we're fighting. We're not fighting Iran. We're not fighting Syria. I hope we aren't. Both of them wholly unattractive regimes. But the last thing those troops who are already overexposed in Iraq need is to provoke a war with Iran, for instance, right on the border. Uh, think of the vulnerability. Where are the reserves that we send? I mean, by this administration's miscalculations, if they want to do that, they're in no position to do it. But what we then have is a country of millions of people facing an enemy, they tell us, of 10 or 15,000 people. This is the administration's estimate, that the insurgents amount to 10 or 15,000 people. If, in fact, we have the degree of support among the Iraqi people that they tell us we have and that we hope we have, why do they need American troops to deal with 15,000 people? Again, this is not a case where we have to defend them against Iran or Syria or any external enemy. This is not a case like North Vietnam and South Vietnam. And that's why I am skeptical. I mean, this is a relatively small number of people who do not have, as you know, great weaponry. Um, what is the major source of the killing and maiming of our, of our brave soldiers? IEDs improvised explosive devices. What you have is a relatively small number of people who are making their own bombs. And look, these are terrible people, and I have every hope that we could catch them. But the fact that the Iraqi society by itself, with all the money we would be willing to, to send them, can't deal with 15,000 people making their own bombs. I mean, these people don't have an airplane. They don't have a tank. They don't have high-powered artillery. They've got mortars and homemade bombs and, and, and rifles and pistols. That makes me very nervous. And I, I do not see any thing that says this gets better until and unless we say, look, we have done a lot for you. We went in and we overthrew this vicious tyrant. And we undid his secret police. And we dismantled his army. And we've helped you to have elections. The time has come to leave unless we are prepared to say we're there forever. And as long as we are there, remember this is 80 to 90 billion dollars a year that makes all these other things harder and harder. And you might say, well, we can afford, we're a rich country, we can afford that and do other things, but the administration says we can't. The justification given for virtually every program that you, many of you, have worked so hard for and that are so important for the veterans who are returning, who are going to need a lot of help. The justification for cutting every single one of them is, we can't afford it. Why can't we afford it? Because we're spending $80 billion in Iraq. And of course, we're, uh, we're doing tax cuts. So what we now need to do is to, is to uh, say that's just unacceptable. And I think it is legitimate to say, look, with all we've done for Iraq, and the administration's plan is to be there forever, or you know, for as long as anybody knows. If, in fact, what they tell us is true, and we are talking about a country of, what, 20 million people facing 15,000 at most insurgents. And, and by the way, you know the military has said in the intelligence, despite what some of the political rhetoric is, there is not a significant number of outsiders there. The, the resistance, the, the killers are mostly Iraqis. There's very little from outside. Well, if this country can't having had its elections, with all the help we've given them, deal with 15,000 very poorly armed rebels, then maybe it wasn't worth quite as much as we did. But in any case, I think the time for us is to pull out and to reassert that we do have some responsibility uh, for each other. Uh, let me just close by saying I think this is the, the key issue here. I'm a capitalist. I believe in the free enterprise system. That's how you create wealth. It's the best way to create wealth. But in addition to creating wealth, it creates a lot of inequality. Some inequality is a good thing. You need it. I think you need inequality to make the system work. But too much inequality becomes socially unhealthy. And I think you can reduce the inequality without interfering with the efficiency of the system in ways that, 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 that prevent social damage. And that's the big difference. We have people in power now who think that all we have to do is to let the people who own capital have more freedom. Take all the restraints off capital. No environmental regulation, no unions, no minimum wage, no restrictions of any kind. Uh, 
and we'll all be back. Don't tax them. Tax, tax work. Don't tax investment. That's part of that theory. We'll all be better off. I think that's clearly untrue. And it's especially, and I mentioned both of these, because what particularly is a problem is putting the two together. Running an ongoing expensive war, we're talking $80, $90 billion a year, far into the future. Remember, this is, as, as things have gotten better, they keep telling us things have gotten better, but it's not less expensive. I mean, it's, it's still costing the same amount of money year by year, month by month. So we have this, these two things put together, and I think the result is... Uh, to do a lot of social damage in the country, including to the veterans. And if you look at the economic situation of the veterans, if you look at what they've been through, et cetera, yeah, somebody in his or her late 20s who spent four or six years in the military is at a disadvantage for reasons that we understand vis-a-vis -vis his or her peers in terms of education and being out of the job market and all these other things. And uh, there ought to be some social responsibility to help them overcome the disadvantage that they incurred by serving the country, and we're going in exactly the opposite direction. Now, I'll throw this open, and if there are any uh, questions or comments, uh, I'll be glad to respond. <laughs> Raise your name to Mike. Yeah. Here comes the mic. Wait for the mic. I'm sorry. Both you and Congressman Meehan have spoken about the disconnect between the needs of the vast majority of people in this country and what's happening in Washington. My question is, if there is any semblance of democratic process going on, one would safely assume that the vast majority of Americans representing in Congress do not want to see what's happening. I don't mean in terms of the war. I mean in terms of what you alluded to, the, the inequality and so on and so forth. How do you explain the inability of Congress, by which I mean both Republicans and Democrats, whose constituencies probably are telling them or should be telling them this doesn't make any sense, that is, the benefits of the tax cuts and so on do not go to the vast majority of people. So how do you explain why policy does not correspond to what most people want? Well, first of all, I think you have to, frankly, look clear, more clearly at what's happening. I reject your suggestion that Democrats and Republicans are equally at fault here. They're in the majority. Most Democrats have voted against those tax bills. Some of them voted in the minority for the early ones. By 2002, we were getting almost all the Democrats against them. So it's simply wrong to say Democrats and Republicans alike. The Democrats will propose a budget very different than the Republicans. We will probably lose. But this, the second thing I would say is this. If the constituencies really felt that way, why did they vote for people who felt the other way? I think part of the problem was this. George Bush was the president on September 11th. Remember, he was not enormously popular before that. Al Gore got more votes than he did. If you look at the polls in September 10th and before, George Bush had not moved the country more in his direction. But then on September 11th, 19 savages murdered thousands of innocent people, and this country was understandably outraged. And whenever you are in charge, and the people in the country unanimously, virtually, want a certain response, or overwhelmingly, you get certain benefit. I mean, George Bush benefited because he happened to be the guy when everybody wanted something to happen. I mean, look, if the score is tied in the last of the ninth, and the bases are loaded, and you get up, you get to be the hero. There could be a lot better hitters sitting on the bench. But you're the one who has the opportunity to be the hero. I mean, if the ball hits you in the rear end, you get to be the hero. But, I mean, George Bush benefited because he was the guy who got to be the hero. He then had the Warning Rock, which, and in the early stages of wars, presidents are always very popular. They're standing up. And he benefited from that, and I think very skillfully, and managed, I think, unfairly, but cleverly, to plant doubts about John Kerry's steadfastness. So I think he won on, in November, not because of what he advocated in terms of uh, domestic programs, but despite that, because he managed to make that the issue. I wish the public had been a little more discerning, and I, and, and I do understand that. But I also want to say, by the way, I, I, I differ with the kind of analysis that says, how come all these wonderful people who believe these things, or how come the, 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 the public that believes all these things, 
How come the members of Congress don't represent them? Well, they voted for them. Look, I got to tell you, I, I have been very critical of many of my congressional colleagues. I think members of Congress, I think elected officials do a lot of things wrong. But you know, sometimes the voters are no bargain either. And they could pay a little more attention. It wouldn't hurt. And um, what I do think, though, is happening now, and I think there's, I think people are having buyer's remorse. I think what happened was that the public bought George Bush's music but now that they're reading the words, they're not so happy. And you're seeing that. The Social Security proposal to go into private accounts is sinking rapidly. The uh, cuts in veterans are not going to happen. We're going to beat them. The, the, requirements, the, the requirements that veterans shell out for the, for, for the privilege of being treated for the illnesses they incurred in their country's service. Um, we're going to beat a lot of those cuts. Essentially what this means is, unfortunately, the deficit won't go down as much as it should. What, what I hope is we'll also get people to vote to fight the tax cuts. But part of the problem is this, to be honest. Many of the same people who resist the cuts and tell us, don't let them charge veterans more, don't cut Amtrak, don't cut housing for the disabled, also tell us to vote for tax cuts. And i got to tell you, I learned this problem in 1969. I was in City Hall, and Kevin White got a lot of pressure to build a swimming pool in Hyde Park. So we agreed to build the swimming pool in Hyde Park. Four months later, we're getting people from Hyde Park calling up and complaining. Well, there's a lot of noise, they're blasting, and all these trucks full of debris going up and down the streets, and they were very upset because we were building the swimming pool that they wanted us to build. And I, I was young, I was starting out, and Freddie Langone, city council, was in the office. I said, Freddie, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of... Kind of, I can't figure out what, what's going on here. First, people were yelling because they didn't have a swimming pool. Now they're upset because we're building a swimming pool. Freddie looked at me with a kind of little pity in his eyes. He patted me on the knee. He said, hey, kid, ain't you heard the news? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And uh, that's part of the problem with the voters. They want the services, but then they don't want the taxes. What I think, but and now I, I accept this responsibility. What we need to do is to connect the dots. The dots between the tax cuts and the war at the same time and the program cuts. So I do believe, I mean, I, I think the hangover from September 11th is why they won. I do believe now that we can make the argument that you're making. I don't mean to disagree with you in that fundamental sense. Yes, I don't think the public wants that. And I believe now we are going to have more luck in turning that around. The Republicans have a dilemma. Either they're going to repudiate Bush's budget or some of them are going to lose. But it's important for us, and this is what we got to do. We have to make it clear. They said connect the dots. We have to make clear that charging veterans for their own health, not cleaning up environmental sites, make it harder to go to college, which is going to be a big problem for veterans when they come back, those who want to go to college. Busting unions, I mean, all, a lot of these things. These are not individual random acts by this administration. Because I think what you have is the single decisions are unpopular. What we need people to understand is this is the inevitable result of this viewpoint. A viewpoint that says you, that, that government's bad. Look at Governor Romney boasting elsewhere at a time when we have unemployment problems here. Now, you know, a lot of the jobs go overseas. You know what jobs can't go overseas? Teaching our kids. Putting out fires, being police officers, being sanitation workers, shoveling the snow, inspecting for health. A lot of the things that are important to the quality of our life we do through municipal government. What's Mitt Romney boasting about? That Massachusetts got rid of more municipal employees than any other state, as if people who fight fires and, 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 and protect the safety of food and pave the streets and arrest criminals as if somehow they were blight on society. And the fewer of them you have, the better. In fact, the richer we are, probably the more we ought to have people working in some of those public jobs. They're not going to send the police jobs to India. They're going to stay here. And a wealthy society can take some of the money we are generating and do that. But this is, the, this is what we have to take head on. The notion that all of the good things in our life are done individually and nothing is done when we work together. In the back, yeah. Yes, you. Um, I was impressed by. Thank you. I was impressed by uh, both the words and the um, paper that uh, Congress. Uh, Congressman Meehan presented and your words about uh, strategy of the, the uh, 
pointing out the costs, the economic costs that the war has uh, has uh, brought about. Um, now, will that be the strategy that you and Congressman Meehan and others will use to try to get a uh, timetable set for withdrawal from Iraq by pointing out the costs both to the uh, not only to the vet to the soldiers in Iraq but to um, American civilians as well. Yes, and um, you know you're right. The main cost, of course, is two and three lives every day of Americans and a lot of Iraqi lives. Um, secondly, you know if you go to a country on the justification that you're there to make their lives better, I don't know how you totally discount the fact that many of them are losing those lives. The dollar cost, I mean, it's just no question. You know, you, 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 you go through the Bush budget and they will tell you that they are proposing reductions in that budget that they regret having to propose. But that's, what, six plus billion dollars a month in Iraq, so that's the problem. Uh, then there were some other ones. I, look, I was for the war in Afghanistan. I think there are times when we need to use the military, although you want to be as sparing as possible. Thanks to this underestimation by them of what was going to be involved in Iraq, we are now not in a position to use the military in places where there might be a national need to do so. We have had more people tied up in Iraq for more time than they had planned on. So you have this problem of stresses and strains on the guard. And stresses, and it's going to be felt, as you know, in recruitment. We we're already beginning to have that. The Marines, for the first time in anybody's memory, are having recruitment problems. The guards having recruitment problems. So that's another cost. The, the, the overstressing of the security. Uh, frankly, you know, these people, we talked about the Vietnam syndrome, which, you know, many of you, I think, welcome, which was after Vietnam, people said, boy, that was such a bad policy by the U.S. that we should be very careful about going in again. But I think they're, they're recreating that with this, with, with how badly they planned for Iraq. So, yes, we will keep hammering at that. But I think, frankly, what th this is... I am not optimistic that we will succeed before now. I think the next chance we will have, and it goes back to the first question as well, are the 2006 congressional elections. That will be a referendum on this approach. If the Democrats were to win big in 2006, I think you would begin to see, I'm afraid we will still be in Iraq by then, although I wish we would be substantially diminished in where we are. But I think that a lot of this is going to be debated between now and the elections of 2006, and that will be the uh, time when there will be a verdict by the voters. Somebody else? Yeah. I couldn't see this. Right. Good morning, Congressman. Thank you for your comments and your insight. Um, I'd, I'd like to bring the focus home here to Massachusetts just for a few minutes, if I may. In 1999, we, we enacted a public law that allowed for 3% of government spent dollars to come to service disabled veteran-owned businesses. In Massachusetts, our goal is even just a little bit lower than that, 2.8%, and that's based on a national average. I, I'm a service disabled veteran-owned business owner. My name is Louis Chelly. I own Leaders Advantage, and I provide free business training to all military members, veterans alike. I'd like to know what we're doing in Massachusetts to try to enforce that law. Making the laws is an excellent start, but enforcing them is, is paramount. And I know that we've missed our goal a couple of years in a row, and I'd like to know, uh, based on the SBA and the GSA's efforts, what we plan to do here in Massachusetts to try to assist to get that law enacted or enforced. This is the first time that specific problem of not meeting the goals is brought to my attention. The answer is... I'm sure all of us in the Massachusetts delegation would be glad to begin that process. Who administers it? The Small Business Administration and the General Services Administration? Right, because that would, the GSA as a purchaser of services in the SBA. What I would ask you to do is just get me those numbers, they don't have to be in great detail, and we will do a letter from all the members of the Massachusetts delegation to the heads of the SBA and the GSA and ask them why we have a problem and ask for a meeting in which we, regionally, in which we can push for it. I, I was not previously aware of it. That's, that's how we will begin to do it. Thank you very much. Yep, in the back? Okay, I can't see lights in my eyes. I have to apologize in advance for a sort of long preamble, but let me first begin by introducing myself. I'm Seth Katz. I'm a student here and I just spent the last year in Iraq. Uh, 
Firstly, let me just comment that I agree with you that there are serious issues of economic inequality in this country that do need to be addressed, and, and I think the chasm is getting worse. But I do want to clarify some issues on which your premise was based in Iraq. Firstly, um, IEDs, yes, they are improvised explosive devices, but it does not mean that the Iraqis were poorly armed or are poorly armed. In fact, there's an enormous weapons cache in Iraq that we have not accounted for. And what they mean by improvised is what they're doing is taking large mortars, stringing them together, and that's the improvisation rather than somebody sitting and create, uh, taking, the, uh, for example, match heads and trying to make a, a, a pipe bomb. So the other issue with that is that uh, Iraqis also, by law, have been entitled to have maintain an AK-47 ammunitions in their houses. They're allowed one per household, and it is, it's, it's customary for them to fire it off periodically, as a matter of fact. So I, to say that they're poorly armed, I think, is inappropriate. Uh, whether they are well organized in that sense and well armed, those munitions can't be used with large. They don't have the devices to fire those anymore, but they certainly still have the devices themselves. Just an observation, I think that most people recognize that the U.S. military is, amongst other things, expected to protect U.S. interests abroad. And I guess my question is, and you, you alluded to it in your previous answer, are you proposing an isolationist strategy, and if not, what is the criteria that we should use as a country as to when to get involved in uh, protecting interests or defending other countries? Would you say that the war in Afghanistan was a manifestation of isolationism? Absolutely not. Did you hear me say I was for the war in Afghanistan? Absolutely. So then what was the question again? Well, what is your criteria? Okay, well, so you, but the suggestion, I, I, what I'm saying is that it seems to me for you to ask if I was for an isolationist strategy when you heard me say I was for the war in Afghanistan, frankly, it seems to me kind of tendentious and not very helpful. We could have differences, but no, I, I, I don't think there's any basis for talking about isolation. Secondly, or first, to go back, uh, you know, you haven't convinced me at all they're not poorly armed. You said they have some of these weapons, they haven't got means of firing them. I, in fact, you've confirmed what I said, that the largest thing they've got are mortars. I said they had rifles, I understand that. But when you were talking about 15,000 people armed with rifles and nothing larger than mortars, no tanks, no planes, no heavy artillery, facing a modern army, that is not heavily armed in my judgment. And I again say that the difference between North Vietnam and the Iraq insurgency is very important. In North Vietnam, we were confronting a country with an army. In Iraq, they're confronting, they say, maybe 10 or 15, 15,000 at most people with, as you said, mortars that they use somewhat and disassemble elsewhere, and nothing heavier. And my point is this. A society which had some cohesion and where there was a good deal of willingness to fight would not be helpless in the face of 15,000 people and wouldn't need a large American army to defend itself. And I think that the fact is that while I am encouraged by what happened in the elections, the inability of Iraqi forces, and we're told we have, what, 100,000 or more armed Iraqis, their inability, and they are certainly much better armed and we're capable of arming them better, their inability to put up much of a defense against a relatively small number of people who have AK-47s and mortars suggests to me, more than suggests to me, says that we have a society that is not, in fact, in that kind of good shape. Now, there were some internal problems. My guess is that if they were willing to use the Kurds more, they could do a better job, but internal hostilities within Iraq prevent that from happening. My, uh, in fact, there have been constraints on using the Kurds. So I repeat, I, I, I would reiterate even if, based on what you said, that these are not heavily armed people when you talk about an army. Yeah, for rebels, they have rifles and mortars. I don't think that should present the degree of difficulty that it does. Then to go back to your question about isolationism, um, apparently you base my view of isolationism on my view that we should not go to war to make countries democratic. I think your notion of isolationism is simply wrong. I said I thought we should be pushing in many ways to make countries democratic. I was glad that we put sanctions on South Africa. I want to cut off trade with Burma. I want to do, put a lot of pressure on Zimbabwe. 
I was for the war with Afghanistan. But what I specifically disagree with is, and so my criteria is this, if you have a country that is a significant threat to you, there are times when a physical response, a war will be appropriate. Afghanistan, remember, by the way, in Afghanistan, that was no war to democratize Afghanistan. The official position of the Bush administration was, give us Osama bin Laden. And if the Taliban had been willing to give us Osama bin Laden for prosecution, there would not have been a war in Afghanistan. That was not a war to liberate Afghanistan. The liberation of Afghanistan was a happy byproduct of the war. But the basis of that war was, and it could have, the Taliban was in fact getting along pretty well with the Bush administration over drug eradication. So I am in favor of the, what I thought was a war of self-defense in, uh, in Afghanistan. Beyond that, I believe the promotion of democracy is a very relevant objective, and it ought to be done through political and economic pressure. I'm pleased with what we're doing now to try to get Syria to pull out of Lebanon. Uh, but I do not think, and here's the, which apparently suggests to you isolationism, that we ought to go to war with countries solely because they are not democratic. And as I look at the situation in Iraq, there were no weapons of mass destruction. There was no significant involvement between them and Al-Qaeda. I do not believe there was any justification for going to war in Iraq other than to democratize it. And I do think it is a mistake for this country to draw up a list of undemocratic countries in the world and systematically go after them one by one with all that that means in terms of the loss of manpower and the loss of money. So that's, that's what I, I would draw the line at that. Beyond that, there should be active economic and political engagement, and as I said, the right to go to war if you need to in self-defense. Any others? I see Steve Lynch is here, and we're in Steve's district, so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to uh, intrude on his territory. Do we have one last question? Yeah, all right, one last question. I gather from what you said, you believe, too, that the Bush administration wants to cut these social programs that we've talked about philosophically. Because yes. They, and that the, the consequence of the spending in Iraq serves as an excuse for them to be able to do this without coming out and indicating that they want all of these things dismantled. And that if we were able to reduce the spending in Iraq or limit it in some ways, they would at least be left more naked in terms of what they are trying to do? Very much so. There's a, there's a good article by Paul Krugman in the New York Times today going after this. We first saw this. David Stockman, who was the budget director under Ronald Reagan when he wrote a book, acknowledged that the Reagan tax cuts that he supported... He didn't think they were going to stimulate the economy. He was for them because he didn't want these social programs. And a lot of the conservatives have a phrase for that. They call it starving the beast. And here's what David Stockman said. David Stockman, the triumph of politics here in the library. Very important because it's what these people are carrying out now. Their view is that things like housing for the elderly and Amtrak and job training programs, that these are a mistake, that these are not what government should be doing. But they also understand that the public likes them. And if the public is asked to choose on a philosophical basis, should we build housing for the disabled or not, should we provide veterans health benefits or not, they will say yes. Therefore, they believe that politically, the only way they will be able to be cut back those programs is first to do the popular thing of cutting taxes, and then after the taxes cut, come back and say, well, we don't have enough money to do it. And that's the case. Yes, the Bush... George Bush would be for cutting most of those things, or at least the people around him would be for cutting most of those things anyway. But what they understand is it would be too hard to get the votes in Congress to do that if they didn't have this deficit. I mean, basically, first they put through tax cuts that exacerbated the deficit. Other factors contributed, but the tax cuts greatly exacerbated the deficit. Then having somewhat created the deficit, they now say, oh, we have to cut these other programs. And that, that is exactly... Uh, the case. Now, that's not why they went to war in Iraq. I don't, I don't accuse them of that. I think that's the neoconservative philosophy. I think it's Paul Wolfowitz. It's their view that uh, going to war with, with Iraq was a good way to kind of convince the rest of the world that they better not mess with America. Um, that's the reason for the tax cuts, in part. But that's, that's the consequence. That, yes, they... they uh, and if you notice... For a long time, the Bush administration and its defendants were denying that the deficit was a problem. 
While they were creating the deficit, they said, don't worry about it. Then once they helped create it by their policies, now they are using the deficit that they largely created as a justification to cut programs, which they never could have cut on their own. Thank you.